Good evening, friends. Good evening. Good, evening. Good evening and welcome to our Maundy Thursday evening service. It is a time where we remember the last supper that Jesus shared with his disciples and the last few moments that he shared with them before heading to the cross. It is a time where we come together both in glad hearts for the ways that our Lord invites us to his table and also with hearts of mindfulness and with lament for the great cost that our Lord went through to bring us an assurance of God's goodness and God's grace. And so let us be joined together in this time. Let us be at one table and of one spirit as we worship and as we reflect on our Lord this evening. I invite you friends to join as we get started in this, our call to worship. You can find it on the screen or in your bulletins. Come, you who are weary with heavy burdens. We come, O oh Lord, to your restful table. Come, you who hunger and thirst. We come, O oh Lord, to your filling table. Come, you whose hands are stained by the works of the world. We come, O oh Lord, to your cleansing table. Come, bear witness to the love of Christ. Our hearts are broken by your great love.
Friends, will you join me in a spirit of prayer? O Lord, our God, you who came to us bringing light and hope into our world in our Lord Jesus Christ, you who lived with us, who walked with us, who taught with us, who shared meals with us, who in all things was a blessing to us. You, O Lord, our, uh, you, O Lord, our God, Christ Jesus, who went even so far as the cross for us. In life, in death, and in all things, you are gracious and glorious. You are merciful and welcoming. and We are blessed to be at your table to share not only fellowship and meal, but to share in your presence, to know that you are with us. We thank you for all the blessings of your presence, all the ways that you have drawn us in to share life with one another, to enjoy meals with one another as you have enjoyed meals with your friends, and to be at common tables and to be present with your spirit. We ask, O oh Lord, that as we gather together this evening, that you would bless our time, that you would bless this place, that your spirit would fill the words of our lips and of our hearts, that in all things we might know you and glorify you. We pray that you would bless the fellowship and the meal that we share this evening as you have blessed so many meals with your friends, that this might be a time for us to draw near to you. And as we reflect on the road, the perilous road that you walked, we ask that you would bless our hearts, though they may be filled with sadness as we contemplate your crucifixion. We ask, O oh Lord, that you be our comfort and our steadfast foundation. In all things, O oh Lord, you are glorious, you are good, and you are worthy of all praise. We lift high and praise your holy name. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 17. Now, before the feast of the Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel that was wrap, wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, that was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you, should, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, 
A servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Will you join me, friends, in a moment of prayer? O oh Lord, our God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your eyes, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of the key characteristics of Jesus' ministry is food, at least so it seems throughout the stories we are told. Throughout scripture, Jesus shares many meals. He initiates many meals. He presides over many meals. From the feeding of the 5,000 to inviting himself over to Zacchaeus' house for dinner, Jesus, it seems, loves a good meal. He loves a good meal even to the extent that people begin to call him out on this. Some of John the Baptist's disciples and the Pharisees ask him why he and his disciples don't fast, why they seem to always be eating when the Pharisees fast and John's disciples used to fast, but Jesus, it seems, and his disciples really do enjoy gathering together for a good meal. Jesus tells them that now is not the time for fasting, though I am sure that Jesus had his fair share of fasting and that he and his disciples, being devout and spiritual people, probably did fast from time to time. But I would wager that more often than not, they enjoyed gathering together for a good meal. And I imagine that there was a lot of things that Jesus loved about sharing a meal with his friends, with strangers, with folks that he called down from trees. The meal was not just about the food, I, I, although I imagine that Jesus did love food a fair bit. I imagine that he loved everything else that happens around a dinner table even more. I imagine he loved the community that was created as they sat around common tables, the opportunity to share in conversation with friends, to see how they are doing, and to be truly present and open with one another in a way that you cannot be except for at a dinner table. It is a time of connection. We share life, we share sustenance, we share the very thing that enables us to go and to be with one another when we gather around a common table for a meal. And so it makes only sense that Jesus loved to be at a dinner table, to do all of those things, to do all the things that he so loved doing in all the other areas of his life, to preach, to teach, to comfort, to heal, to nourish, to uplift, to support, all of these things are accomplished so naturally around the dinner table for a meal. And so, as we reflect on a particular dinner table that Jesus and his friends gathered around, we imagine that this is not an uncommon practice for them. To come to a dinner table is probably something that they have done time and again, a well-worn practice and perhaps something that they often looked forward to. But this meal is different feels different. And even though the disciples may not have a full understanding of what is to come, they perhaps don't know just exactly where this particular meal fits in with all the other meals that they have shared with Jesus. The atmosphere must be different. It must be more weighty. I imagine that it's weighty for a number of reasons. Chief among them, as we have noted in our scripture, Jesus was aware that there is one amongst his dearly beloved friends who will betray him. There is an air of suspicion, of apprehension, of betrayal as they gather around at the dinner table. I'm sure that the disciples could feel this, even if they didn't know exactly who it was. And the nature of this betrayal will lead Jesus 
away from his disciples to a place where they cannot follow. And so there is a finality to this dinner that they are sharing. They may not know it, but this is the last one of its kind for many ways and for many reasons. Sure, they might have a few to come here on earth, a few snacks of fish on beachside shores, and certainly there will be meals in the great beyond that they will share, but this is the last of its kind, the last time that they gather here on earth around a common dinner table as they so often have before and as they so loved to share that meal. And so there is a sadness, I imagine, among the disciples and among Jesus as they gather around their dinner table this evening. But it's not only sad and weighted, it's also a strange dinner table that they gather around. To cap off their dinner, they do not have coffee and desserts, but instead Jesus does something rather bizarre. He takes off his outer clothes, the things that he would wear, and is just in his undergarments, and he wraps a towel around his waist and begins to wash his disciples' feet, to kneel before them, to wipe away the dust of long roads traveled, to clean away the sweat of hard work, to wash their feet. It is a strange dinner and a strange table that these disciples find themselves at. There are two important things that Jesus accomplishes in these two acts, sharing a dinner table with his disciples before his final moments on this earth, before his resurrection, and in washing his disciples' feet. First, as we turn our attention to the table it is an important work to establish this table. I imagine that in the coming days, the coming couple, the coming few days, as his disciples reflect on what has just happened, that as they ponder as to the last moments that they shared with their teacher and their Lord and wonder why things were happening, their minds must have wandered back to this dinner table. They must have remembered what was going on. They must have thought if they missed something, if there was any clues or if there was anything special that was revealed as they gathered around this dinner table. And in the years to follow, I imagine that they went on to continue to reflect on this dinner, this last great, sad dinner that they shared with their friend. And so what Jesus accomplishes in this image of this final dinner table with his friends is establishing that image and to give them hope. Hope that in what is to come, Christ's table will be established not only in that one final moment, but always and everywhere, beyond even the confines of this worldly plane, Christ's table persists, seeks to welcome those who are in need of filling and nourishment, to uplift them, to care for them, and to comfort them. And so this image of a table becomes a familiar and beloved one, not only for the disciples who were hungry, but for all of those who would come to follow, to know that it is at tables just like this where we may encounter and know our God. And two, in washing his disciples' feet, he both cleanses and prepares them for what is to come. Christ not only cleanses his disciples' feet with water and with a rag wrapped around his waist, but in the next coming day, he will stoop even lower than their feet to clean stains much harder to remove than that of just dirt and sweat clean the stains of sin that mark not only his disciples, but all of humankind. Christ goes not above and beyond, but below and beyond for the sake of bringing a wondrous renewal and cleansing to all who are in need. 
this cleansing is not just a nice thing. It not only gives the disciples and those who receive Christ's cleansing grace nice clean feet upon which to walk, but it prepares them for their roads ahead. In the coming years and days, the disciples will walk from that moment to the far corners of this world, empowering others to do likewise, to continue on their journeys. Christ prepares their feet for that journey, that they might walk with blessed feet, touched by none other than their Savior and their friend. And so we, tonight, gather here to remember both of these things, to embrace both of these things, to share in a table, in the way that Christ shared a table with his friends, to share a meal with one another as Christ shared a meal with his friends, to remember the love, the care, and the kindness offered to all who answer the invitation to Christ's table. And though we don't really do foot washing as a thing in our common everyday lives. It's not a practice that is familiar to us as it was for the disciples. We still recognize the need to be cleaned in preparation for the works that we set about in following Christ's call. And especially these days, uh, we are all the more attuned to the need for washing our hands. It is a practice that we do regularly. Before we share a meal, we wash our hands. Before we prepare that meal, we wash our hands. When we hold a newborn baby, we wash or at least sanitize our hands. And when we visit a loved one or a friend in the hospital, we wash and sanitize our hands. To clean our hands is a symbol that we care for those that we are about to touch and to engage with. It is a symbol of our own awareness that nothing that we would want to bring to them should harm them. That we might begin the very touch that we share with those around us, with hands made clean. And so, as we seek to follow Christ, we seek not only to cleanse our hands and the works that they do with water and with soap, but with the Spirit of our Lord. That in all that we do, all that we touch with our hands, might bring God's grace and God's love with it and share God's glory to all the world. And so, friends, I invite you to prepare one another for sharing in a meal with one another first by doing it, that time-honored tradition of washing our hands. We have a uh, we'll have a little demonstration of how this is going to go. So I'm going to Kim to come forward and uh, help me uh, give some instructions about what we are going to do this evening as we wash each other's hands. You may notice that on the ends of their table there are a few different bowls. We're going to be using all of these. And the way that this will work is that you'll pass these bowls down the line as you wash each other's hands. So Kim, you come on. back as you go along to help wash each other's hands. And now you may notice that that means that the person at the end of your line does not have a, a set of hands to wash, but you have a very important role. You will begin uh, the sharing of our meal. You'll notice on the back table there are a few plates of bread and of grape juice. And as we remember the meal that Christ our Lord shared with his disciples, we too will share in a meal. And so friends, let us prepare ourselves and make ourselves ready not only to share this be engaged in all the acts of service that we are called to as we 
follow Christ's wondrous example of service to all in the world.
Well, friends, with washed hands, we have been made ready to to share a meal, to break bread with and for one another. But before we do so, I invite you to join in singing and reflecting on our closing hymn as we remember that it is from this last supper that Christ shared with his friends and disciples that we go to, that he goes to the cross to show his great and immense love, not only for his friends and disciples, but for all humankind. we share in this meal and prepare to go on to reflect on all that Christ our Lord has done for us, will you receive this blessing. May the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ grant you peace and hope, fulfillment and nourishment in all things here and beyond. Amen. I invite you, friends, to break bread 
for one another. <coughs> Offer each other a piece of bread. Pour a cup of juice for one another as we share in a meal as Christ shared in many meals with his friends. <laughs>